As U.S. corporations avoid paying billions in tax by moving money offshore, Google's chairman says tax avoidance is capitalism. Shouldn't politicians be doing more to stop such practices? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Kimberly Halkett. Earlier this week, it was revealed that Google avoided paying $2 billion in tax by channeling $9.8 billion from international subsidiaries into Bermuda, which has no corporate income tax. Well, the practice is perfectly legal. And Eric Schmidt, the company's chairman, told Bloomberg that he was proud of Google's tax structure. And numerous corporations use tax havens, but a Senate committee investigation found that five of the top 10 companies with the biggest offshore cash balances are in the technology sector. They include Hewlett Packard and Microsoft, who shifted $21 billion offshore between the years 2009 and 2011. Well, it's estimated that offshore tax avoidance cost the U.S. government $150 billion annually. And at a time when Washington is fixated on the debate over the so-called fiscal cliff, there seems to be little political will to address the problem. Well, this contrast to attitudes in Europe, when it was revealed how little tax companies including Starbucks and Amazon have paid in the UK, there was a public outcry and parliamentary hearings were held. What's more, the European Union has drawn up an action plan to try and claw back at least some of the revenue being lost. So can tax avoidance be stopped? We asked for an interview with someone from Google, but they declined to take part in this program. However, we are joined by Eric Savitz. He's the San Francisco bureau chief for Forbes. In the studio is Nicole Teishan, executive director of Tax Justice Network USA, and Ryan Grimm, Washington bureau chief for the Huffington Post. I want to start with you, Nicole. So Google is in the headlines right now for alleged tax avoidance. Is this reasonable? Is it reasonable that they're in the headlines or reasonable what reasonable they're doing? what they're doing. <laughs> um, well, what they're doing is not common. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not uncommon. Um, a lot of the technology companies are able to uh, have their intellectual property registered in another country with a low tax, such as Bermuda or Ireland. And with that comes a, a really reduced uh, bill to the government. And, and, and maybe, Ryan, you can talk to a little bit about the fact that it, as Nicole points out, it isn't uncommon. There are a lot of companies that are doing this, uh, specifically tech companies as well. Uh, is this something, it's legal, but right. is it fair? Right, when, it, when, when Eric Schmidt says this is capitalism, sure, it, it is. And th this, is, this is companies competing over profits. And uh, Tom Coburn, a Republican uh, in the Senate, uh, countered some of, the, some of the efforts to, to, to beat up these companies by saying, look, we created these loopholes, they're just using these loopholes. And you know, more or less, that's true. Some some of these uh, some of these activities might actually be outright illegal. That's a, that's a different question. So the, so the the question for us then is, you know, should this be legal? And I, I think this is probably the biggest issue facing government over the over the next century, not counting uh, climate change, which you know could make everything <laughs> moot anyway. That's a different but show. Just how. You know, whether or not states across the globe can continue to fund themselves as, as we continue to have this yawning inequality, you know, all these corporate profits and these executive profits, if they can move them around and governments can't capture them, then it, it's a real problem of how do, you how do you fund a government. Well, let's take a look at exactly who is, is able to do this and, and just how much are they enjoying these uh, corporate loopholes or opportunities. This year, the Center for Tax Justice analyzed the financial reports of 285 Fortune 500 companies. Here's what they found. Now, based on information the corporations themselves released, the center found they had more than one and a half trillion kept overseas by the end of 2011. Now the profits of just 10 corporations account for roughly a sixth of this amount or about 209 billion dollars. Microsoft, Apple, Eli Lilly, Amgen and Dell top this list. The center says these corporations have released enough financial information to indicate that they have paid little or no taxes on their offshore money to any government. Now another watchdog group, the Tax Justice Network, estimates offshore corporate holdings equal about a third of total global 
uh, total global assets. Uh, Eric, I want to bring you in here. I mean, uh, Nicole brought this up, that the tech industry does use this strategy a lot because of the nature of the industry. Uh, is that sort of what lends itself, the, the fact that so much business is being done outside the United States, that it tends to be uh, technical companies that are, are taking advantage of these tax strategies? Well, <clears throat> there's a couple of things at work here. So for one, it is true that um, many technology companies get the bulk of their revenue uh, overseas. If you look at uh, Google, for example, um, uh, around half or a little over half of their revenues are coming from uh, customers who are outside the United States. And so they do generate a lot of profits outside the United States. And there, there is, in effect, two separate issues here. Uh, there's one, one issue is uh, should Google uh, have to uh, pay more tax than it's paying now. And that's, I don't think it's incumbent on Google to go out of its way to pay more taxes than it can figure out, uh, uh, figure out how to, uh, how to, if they can figure out how to pay less in a legal way. But then there's sort of a separate issue, which is under US, uh, uh, ta the US tax code, if you have cash that's been generated, profits that have been generated outside the country, and then try and bring them back to the United States, uh, you're then subject to corporate tax that you wouldn't otherwise have to pay. And so as a result, you have uh, many large U.S. Uh, companies, in particular technology companies, that have large uh, piles of cash um, outside the country, and they're not going to bring it back unless there's a change in the tax code. But um, as Ryan uh, points out here, that like he Congress said, is inclined to do. right? As Ryan pointed out, though, you know, it's, it seems sort of interesting that often these companies are going to Bermuda to, to put this money. But you, you could certainly make the argument most of the revenue is not coming from Bermuda. Is that right, Ryan? Right. I mean, I'm sure they made a couple bucks in Bermuda from from searches, uh, from by people who were down there on vacation. But by no means did they make. Two billion dollars in profit. When you, you know, when they're saying that they, they made uh, all of this, re you know, all, all of this huge amount of revenue offshore, right? But offshore means in well, UK but, but let, let's and not in Spain and Italy. Revenue. Let's not confuse right, right. But but I, I, let's not confuse revenue and profits. If you look at where uh, where so mo you know, most of uh, Google's revenue is coming from search advertising. If you look where most of their, those searches are taking place, they are being conducted by users outside of the country. So there, in effect, there's there's a, a tax strategy that shifts, uh, shifts some dollars to other jurisdictions, but there's a separate issue, which is that right, for some of these companies... Right, what they're trying to do is, um, ex they're explicitly trying the, to confuse revenues and profits. Well, That's maybe, Nicole, phrase, do you want to jump in here? Because, I mean, Eric does make a valid point, too, though, the fact that, you know, they're not doing anything illegal. These are strategies that have been set up, and they are simply carrying out and exercising what has been afforded to them. Right, and I... I I think that there's a we, we can't really hold the, the corporations particularly accountable for it because they're going to take advantage of the system uh, and they're going to try to maximize profits for shareholders and the problem is is that we need to change the system we need the the government to to finally take this on and to, to Ryan's point this is something that is going on all over the world it's this race to the bottom on taxation and what happens is Company, it's not companies competing with other companies, it's governments competing with each other. And when, you, when that happens, you end up with you know, a society with the worst roads and the worst you know, schools and, and a crumbling infrastructure. You can't fund a government that way. But some, I think some of this stuff, though, you could actually hold them accountable for. Let's say a company uh, develops some sort of uh, technology, some IP, in the United States. And then, and probably did it with R and D help from the right. from taxpayers. Right. And then they they transfer that IP to Bermuda, and say that all profits related to that uh, particular product are coming into Bermuda, while all of the costs that went into developing it are going to get written off on the taxes. I think that there might be some areas there that the IRS could actually take take some action. Well, yeah, well let's talk about that. that a little bit. Well, because but we this can, is not okay, about the IRS, right? right? This is. You need to, you need to change you need to change tax policy. I mean, no one is accusing uh, Google in this case of uh, in any way violating IRS regulations or other, uh, any other federal law. They're taking advantage. They of They may not uh, be violating the, it, but there the are, there have exist. been many arguments and reports that show that many of these companies are not paying any taxes at all by 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 keeping the revenue outside of the United States. They are completely avoiding taxes. I mean, isn't there the social argument to be made that you know many of these companies have made these profits as a result of uh, you know a workforce that was educated through government dollars, maybe you know public education. Uh, student loans. Isn't there the argument to be made, too, that they should have to give something back? 
Well, you could also make the argument, right, so that in, say, the case of Google or uh, let's take Apple as an example. You know, Apple has been accused of some of the same kinds of uh, techniques to avoid paying taxes. Um, Apple would say in its defense, look, we employ almost 50,000 people in the state of California. We generate, um, uh, you know, uh, through, through the people that we employ and through the contractors who supply us with components, we uh, pump millions, you know, billions of dollars into the economy. Um, and so we are taking, you know, a part in the economy in a major way. There's a risk also that if you, uh, you, you try and um, change the rules in a way that is uh, significantly adverse to the interests of these large companies that they'll, they will move um, not just um, uh, not, not just be shifting dollars around, but they'll be shifting jobs around. So, so, you know, so you basically your argument is this, this, is this is capitalism. This is capitalism. And it, this is, that was Eric Schmidt's argument. I'm not sure that he, um, he, he put this situation in the best light the way he described it, but at the end of the day, look, if you're the CEO of a, or, or you know, Eric's case, the chairman of, of Google, part of your responsibility is to act as a fiduciary for your shareholders, and your, part of your job is to maximize profits. And you know that's within the reach of the law. Um, so uh, he's not, you know, he he's not advocating doing anything that's illegal. He's basically saying, look, our job is to to make the most money that we can for our shareholders, and then to take that money that we generate and put it to work, creating new products, building new facilities, generating but, but, new but jobs. But at the expense of what? I mean, Nicole, maybe economy. you want to jump in here. I mean, is it even possible to estimate how much is being lost that could be put into things like public infrastructure and other things that would benefit the greater good? Right. Well, the the the, the best estimates we have, and you're right, it's, it's hard to count what you don't know about, too. So there's, there's, there's sort of a... Uh, a lack of, of information because what's reported to the IRS is not is not the same number that's reported to shareholders. And isn't it true too that many corporations say it's impossible to estimate and, and that's an ex ex it's almost like pleading the fifth. Right, it, right. We it's, don't know. Well, I mean part of this whole argument and it's something that we face all, you know in our work that we do in trying to educate the public about this is the idea that this issue is too complicated, people can't wrap their heads around it and that people are going to be afraid of, of really digging in. And on a very basic level, people really do understand that if they paid more than, you know, 2% of their uh, in income taxes, they're paying more than Apple. Well, let's take a look at just how much might be lost. I mean, estimates of just how much money is hidden in offshore tax havens varies according to the U.S. Public Research Group. But it is generally thought that tax havens allow corporations and the very wealthy every year to avoid paying $150 billion in U.S. taxes. Now, this money could provide loan guarantees for an additional half million small businesses, for instance. Uh, it could fund four years of free school breakfasts and lunches for double the number of low-income students students receiving them now and it could even provide a tax cut of you know more than a thousand dollars for every person who files taxes in America and more than cover the 109 billion dollars in automatic spending cuts that will take effect in 2013 if Congress does not avert the so-called fiscal cliff I mean Ryan I mean doesn't that make the argument right there too when governments are arguing over you know cutting you know programs to seniors or critical defense spending, shouldn't this be something that they should also be in the discussion? Well, I think that's clearly what's driving the politics here and in, in, the, in the UK and in Italy around this. And, and in some ways, it's almost karmic revenge in the, se in the sense that uh, the corporate, you know, cor uh, I was going to say corporate America, but the corporate world has been kind of, you know, running, you know, uh, launching an assault against the welfare state across the globe over the last uh, several decades. And Part of that assault involves uh, deficit hysteria. They've succeeded in amping up the deficit hysteria, but kind of one, one of the unintended consequences of it is that they say, oh, okay, if we're going to take the deficit seriously, let's go out and find uh, some real money here. And so there's this organization right now in the U.S. called uh, Fix the Debt, which is spending more than $30 million to argue on behalf of austerity. They have what's called a CEO council, a lot of CEOs that go out on, on, uh, on, on television and go to the Capitol Hill and the White House and argue for cuts. But if you look at what they themselves are doing, they're getting a ton of corporate welfare. They're, get, they're getting all of these uh, tax advantages. And so it, it's kind of changed the conversation back to them. Well, okay, if this is really a problem, is 
cutting Social Security the thing we should do, or is taxing you guys a little bit more the thing we should do? Well, and you know, you bring up the very important point. You know, that's the argument that, that corporations are making. And Eric, I want to ask you. You know, Google's own model, or motto rather, corporate motto is is "Don't be evil." But many are arguing that, in fact, these policies and this implementation of following these sort of tax avoidance strategies is exactly counter to their corporate motto, don't be evil, that, that it is hurting the, the people it could be helping. Well, you know, I think there's a couple of, there's a couple of things I'd say about that. So, uh, yeah, you know, don't be evil, don't be evil. Some people would argue that Google sort of, uh, that motto has outlived its, its usefulness for Google. But I, I think in this case, you know, they, they, do, they, have a, they do have a fiduciary role as a uh, managing the uh, investments of their shareholders to maximize profits. I think that's what they're doing. I think there's another element of this, though, that you need to take into consideration, which is that um, our own corporate tax uh, law is, in a sense, preventing um, companies from bringing some of this overseas cash back into the United States. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So um, if you think about so Cisco Systems, uh, you know, the uh, telecommunications equipment, a, a company makes routers and servers and things like that. Um, they have um, most of their corporate cash is held outside the country and because it would be subject to considerable tax if they tried to bring it back inside the country, uh, they, they've been utilizing it offshore. So they've been doing things like So um, the corporations um, are the buying, victims because they would really want Europe. to bring they're, the money in and, and the, these strategies are preventing them from doing not that? Gonna, is that what you're they're saying? They're not going to what I'm saying is if, the, if they brought it back in, it would be subject to, you know, considerable tax, 25 or 30 percent of the cash. Would, but isn't that uh, what go, ordinary uh, Americans are paying? I mean, it, it, why is that yeah, unreasonable? Yeah, but the point is that, right, but um, it's not a matter of being unreasonable. It's a matter that from a, uh, from a corporate management standpoint, they're just not going to do it. So they're, and rather than bring the cash back to the United States where they might be able to, say, build facilities in the U.S. or and hire more people and maybe buy U.S. companies or pay dividends to their shareholders, uh, what they're doing is they're buying European companies and they're investing in European manufacturing facilities. And you're seeing, you're seeing the same thing from, uh, from other technology companies. So thus you see uh, Microsoft, for example, spend almost... Uh, I think eight and a half billion dollars to buy Skype, which was, uh, you know, incorporated uh, in Europe. So they were able to use cash they held overseas, uh, and it was n that cash that was never subject to U.S. tax. If they had tried to bring it back into the U.S., um, uh, they'd be paying, you know, again almost thirty percent of that cash into the U.S. So Nicole, uh, to the IRS, Eric does, and so they just don't okay, do it. Yeah, it's not right. about a wrong or not wrong. It's just not going to happen. And Nicole, he brings up a good Unless point. You know, this policy. is the mindset of you know corporate America. They're not going to do it. So is right. it incumbent upon governments? You know, we've seen this in the UK. There's been a sort of an effort to try and recoup some of this money. Do you see something like that happening in the United States? Well, we we tried this experiment in 2004. Um, corporations were offered with a repatriation holiday or a tax holiday, where they were able to bring back um, money at a rate of five percent, a tax rate of five percent. And with the idea that it was going to spur all of this investment here in the United States and it was going to allow them to create jobs and what we ended up seeing, and this is, you know, to me, this is the most concrete thing, the most concrete example. They didn't do any of that. In fact, many of them cut thousands and thousands of jobs after they received this tax break. They bring the money back and they're paying, you know, they're buying stock, they're paying their CEOs. It's not a matter of, uh, to me, it, it, we've, we've just have seen this happen before and they haven't invested it here in the U.S. Right, and, and, there's, a, and, and, there's, and there's a reason for that. Well, you know, they, they did this in two... And, and, well, let me, I'll do let me talk here. to... I want to play something for you. This is the White House press briefing today. Um, Jay Carney, the White House press secretary, is commenting on this Google story. And it's very interesting because it brings up sort of the point how this doesn't seem to be on the radar. Listen to what he had to say at the White House briefing when asked about the Google story. Hey, uh, since tax reform is a big piece of this, you were outspoken in the last campaign about saying uh, Mitt Romney's use of offshore accounts, while legal, was not fair. Um, do you share the same concern, level of concern, about Google and Eric Schmidt, who's been an advisor to the president, informal advisor, um, using accounts in Bermuda to not pay their fair share of taxes? Uh, I'm not even aware of that story, so I don't have so an opinion. Of course, in the last couple of days, you know, I've been focused on the fiscal cliff, on Syria, on okay. uh, North Korea, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of those stories. Ryan, he says he's been focused on the fiscal cliff. Isn't this kind of an element when you're talking about trying to generate revenue, revenue versus cuts? It's hard to believe that soundbite. 
Well, it was funny on a lot of levels, yeah. I mean, of course he's seen this story. He gets clips, and Eric Schmidt's kind of a big deal. And he's, he, you know, he, re, you know, he, 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 has, an, he, he has an Internet connection. Uh, so, so, <laughs> They've searched and, it on and Google. Then, and then to use the excuse that I've been focused on this deficit reduction package, so I haven't seen this, <laughs> is, is, is also hilarious. But the, to, go back, to go back to the 2004 situation, you know, it's understandable that politicians believed that all of this money would come flowing back into the United States because they've been told that for years by corporate lobbyists and corporations, you know, get rid of this tax and we'll invest here. But it's a lie. Corporations invest where they see a profit. That, and that, that's all there is to it. If they think that building a plant in Indiana is going gonna, is gonna to lead to creating a profit, then they're going to do it. They don't lack for the cash. They can leave their cash offshore and they can get a, they can get a loan. They, they, At a lower know, rate than Apple, actually paying a tax. Apple does not have a problem getting financing for projects in the United right. States. And it's ludicrous to suggest that Apple would love to expand its American operations, but the only thing holding it back is that it just doesn't have any money. It, it has that money over there in the Caymans, but it just can't get to it. No, there are banks in the United States that will lend Apple money at extremely favorable rates. So if they see a business opportunity in the United States, they will build the factory. The idea that, uh, that, that they'll only do it if you give them this tax holiday is a lie, just so that they can get the holiday, bring the money back in, and then, do, and then you'll see a massive dividend where the shareholders extract the wealth from this company. Well, I guess I want to open this up. Then. So what really needs to happen? I mean, if, is it Congress that needs to address this? Um, you know, the argument is made that many wealthy members of Congress are enjoying some of these strategies themselves, so there's no incentive for them to, to change any of these laws. I mean, Eric, what do you think needs to be done? Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the companies are going to follow the rules that got set, right? So if you, if you provide them with tax breaks, they will take advantage of tax breaks, right? If you, uh, I mean, this, this is no different than uh, uh, than an individual uh, who gets an opportunity to, to to make take a deduction on their taxes. If you're told that you can deduct your mortgage interest on your on your 1040, you're going to deduct your mortgage interest on on the 1040. If you find other uh, tax strategies that will lower what you have to pay, uh, then you will take advantage of them. That's basically what Google is doing. It's what the other uh, uh, these other companies are doing. Um, if you want them not to do that, then you have to change the rules. I mean, it, I think it's pretty straightforward. But, Nicole, how likely is that, that these rules are going to be changed? I mean, is there more of an effort in Congress? Is there any interest? Well, uh, so just to, to talk about why things have been slow and, and why it's hard to, to change the rules actually goes back to the point of not just wealthy members of Congress who use these tax strategies, but members of Congress who receive large donations from these companies with CEOs and who ha CEOs who have the ears of these members um, the, the Senate Finance Committee, House Ways, Ways and Means Committee, and you look at it, who's giving these guys money, well, you look, it's the same companies that are benefiting from these uh, tax strategies. It, it sounds like a losing equation for the ordinary American when you start taking into account the, the corporate attitude, the, the lawmakers who have no incentive. I mean, Ryan, it, it almost seems hopeless. Well, I mean, the other problem facing legislation is that there's, there's, there's really no countervailing force here. So you have corporations who want to keep the, the tax rates extremely low. And then you don't really have anybody on the other side. You know, for you know, the middle half of the 20th century, you had organized labor um, that, 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 that really uh, offered a counter to that. And because of that, there was a higher tax rate on, on uh, corporate income, which then helped to fund a, a more but robust But in the U.K. and that, Europe, we're starting to see lawmakers making an effort, at least making these discussions. In fact, there was, when it came to Starbucks, there was even sort of, uh, you know, public boycotting of the company and pressure that, that eventually forced Starbucks to, to begin to pay. Right. So, I mean, Our outrage what hasn't it, caught up. <laughs> it's you know, it's there, there, there's, a, there's some other elements here, though, that you can't, you can't forget that, first of all, U.S. corporate tax rates are uh, relatively high compared to uh, many other jurisdictions, and and you also have an element here where we're uh, we're competing. Uh, you know, we we have another economic problem. We're competing for jobs, and so if you want to keep these companies creating jobs in the U.S., if you want them to keep their uh, you know keep themselves uh, domiciled in 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 the U.S., you know, you you don't want to go too far to tip the scale in the direction of let's just tax the corporations and. Uh, um, and you know, and they'll just you know take it because that's what they're going to do. I mean, at some level, you're going to put there. There's an argument that jobs will get pushed out of the country um, in response to uh, tougher tax rules. You see that you know happen at the state level uh, where people shift uh, shift jobs, um, say out of California into more tax friendly uh, jurisdictions. 
Um, and so, so there's, right. you know, there's another side to the argument you need to be careful. And, and just 20 seconds left, Ryan, I'll give you the right. final and word. And that goes back to what I was saying at, at the beginning. This is, this is the problem confronting states across the globe. And, and unless they work together, then they're not going to be able to solve the problem. He's exactly right about that. All right. Eric Savitz, Nicole Tashan, and Ryan Grimm, we appreciate you joining us for this discussion. And we appreciate you watching this show. That's all for the team here in Washington, D.C. for now. Thanks for watching.